we sure had a nice warm summer. <laughs> I hope we'll have a warm winter too. You know, looking at my calendar, I discovered this is my last sermon at the East Church for this year, 2014. So I've decided to share with you a passage that really opened my eyes to the incredible good news of the gospel. Guess from which book it is. There, very good for you. Ah. Okay, Romans. And the passage I'm going to study with you is chapter 5, 12 to 21. Please turn your Bibles to that passage. Now, I want to be very frank with you. This is a very difficult passage. Is one of, this passage is one of Scripture's most difficult passages. passage. Not many sermons are preached on it, even in other denominations. Yet, folks, it deals with the very, very heart of the gospel message. You know, I once asked a guy who teaches, who taught theology at PUC, I said, can you explain me this passage? You know what his answer was? Sorry, I cannot do it. It's too difficult. <laughs> but folks, when God opened my eyes to this passage, I realized that every Adventist needs to understand this passage. It's incredible good news. I've entitled it The Two Adams, and I'll tell you why. Okay? We start with the meaning of the word Adam. It's a Hebrew word. Please turn your Bibles. Keep your finger in Romans 5. Turn to Genesis chapter 5. And I want you to notice what Moses penned in verse 1 and 2. Genesis chapter 5. He got it? But well, here it is. Verse 1. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Verse 2, he created them, plural, male and female, Adam and Eve, and blessed them. And he called them. What did he call them in your Bibles? Some will have mankind, and some will have Adam. But what Moses wrote was the word Adam, because the word Adam in Hebrew, means mankind. So Adam was not just, when God created Adam, he was just one individual. God created the entire human race in that one man. That's why the word Adam means mankind. Okay, now. However, to understand this important passage, we must first solve a major accusation made by non Christian religion, especially the Islamic scholars. I had to face this issue when I was a missionary in Africa. Their accusation is that Christianity teaches legal fiction. Now what do they mean by that? Well, here it is. Legal fiction means an innocent man or innocent person dying for the guilty. This, they say, is illegal and even in scripture brings that out. Okay? I've given, there are many texts. I've given you two. One from the book of the law, Deuteronomy chapter 24. Chapter 24 and verse 16. Please look at what Moses wrote in the book of the law, which is the fifth book of the Torah. Deuteronomy 24 verse 16. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for what? His own sin. Then turn to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18 spends a whole section of that chapter on this issue. When you get home, turn to Ezekiel 18, read Verses 1 to 20. He spends a whole section. I'm going to read only the conclusion, which is verse 20. Ezekiel 18, verse 20. The soul who sins shall die. The, pers the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous 
shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. This is a legal issue, folks. You cannot transfer guilt and punishment from a guilty person to an innocent person. But the problem is, yet sinless Christ, he committed no sin, died for sinful mankind. There are many texts, you know, we will deal with Romans 5.18 because it's part of our passage. But please turn to 1 Peter. And notice what Peter penned in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just or the righteous, because that's what the word means, for the unjust, the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh and made alive by the Spirit. So how can we teach, and it is biblical, that Jesus died in our place? And the Islamic scholars raised the question, what qualified Christ to die in our place? That is the issue. And the Christian church has not solved that issue. And let me be frank with you, 70% of the world population are non-Christians. And if we are to convert them to Christianity, to the gospel, we need to solve this problem. I wrestled it for years, you know. And then I did my dissertation, the 1880 message in 1970 at Andrews University. And I discovered their solution was very clear and it opened my eyes. Okay, let's go on. The answer to this accusation is biblical solidarity. This concept is unfortunately foreign to the Western mind. That's why our pioneers had a hard time understanding the most precious message God brought to our church based on biblical solidarity in 1888. They rejected it. And do you know what happened? At that very same time, Congress was about to pass a law, the Sunday law. And when we turn our back to this message, God used one of the two men, A.T. Jones. He went to the Congress and using the arguments of religious liberty, he managed to stop that Sunday law being passed. Okay, let's go on now. Two passages can help us to understand biblical solidarity. Now, I, I'll be frank with you. You may not comprehend Biblical solidarity. It is not a Western concept. It's a part of Jewish culture. But please, even though you don't comprehend this truth, please accept it. You know, I, I, I'm convinced Abraham could not understand. He could not comprehend how his wife could have a child after she passed the age of childbearing. But in spite of that, he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. We have to take God at his word, even though we may not understand there are many things I don't understand. I don't understand how Christ could be fully God and fully man in one person. That makes no sense to me. In fact, the Christian church argued over this for over 400 years until in the Council of Chalcedon, they came to the agreement that he was fully God and fully man in one person. They called it a mystery, something that we cannot explain, but it is biblical. Okay, here's the first passage I want you to look at. Genesis Chapter 25. I'm taking one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. There are many examples. I'm just giving you two. Because I know you're waiting for potluck. Chapter 25. I'm going to read verse 21 to 23. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife. His wife was Rebecca. Because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And as you know, she conceived twins. But the children struggled together with her. Before they were born, they were already fighting. Can you imagine? And she said, if all is well, if this is a blessing from God, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Listen to God's answer. And the Lord said to her, to what? What does your Bible say? To what? Nations, not to individuals. Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your body. 
one people will be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. When God looked at Esau, he was not looking at an individual. He was looking at the father of a whole nation called the Edomites. And he was looking at Jacob as the father of the Israelites. This is biblical solidarity, folks. So it wasn't Esau who served Jacob. It never happened. It was the Edomites who served the Israelites. So God is talking in solidarity language. Okay, let's go on. Note what God said to Rebekah. Isaac wife regarding the twins Esau and Jacob not that Esau the older would serve Jacob the younger but Esau's descendants the Edomites would serve Jacob's descendants the Israelites this folks is biblical solidarity it's very common in the Bible and the only scholars in our church that have understood this area are the Old Testament scholars the New Testament are struggling with this concept you know it's not common in our way of thinking. Let me give an example. One day, a student at, at, uh, at the high school in Walla Walla did something terrible. And the teacher stood up before the class and said, I want that student to own up. And that person did not own up. And she made this statement, you students know who did it. So if you don't own up, I'll punish all of you. And they did not own up and they were all punished. One of the students was the daughter of a professor that you all know at Walla Walla, Old Testament professor. And she went to her father. This is unfair. Why should we be punished for somebody else's mistake? And the father, who was Old Testament scholar, said to his daughter, I'm afraid the fact that you knew who did it and did not own up, you are part of the problem. So you deserve to be punished. He did not cite his daughter. He cited the teacher. Okay, now. I'm going now to the New Testament. Please turn your Bibles to Hebrew. The book of Hebrew was written for the Jews of the New Testament times. And the purpose of this book was to convince the Jews that Christ was the reality of all the types and shadows and promises of the Old Testament. That's why the key word in Hebrews is the word better. He's a better revelation, he's a better sacrifice, he's a better everything. And in chapter 5 to the first part of chapter 8, the writer of Hebrews is proving to the Jews that Christ as a high priest is superior, is better than the Levitical priest of the Old Testament. And he uses the biblical solidarity argument. First of all, you know that only the Levites could become priests. Christ did not belong to that tribe. So look at chapter 6 of Hebrews and the last verse. Hebrews 6 and verse 20. Where the forerunner has entered, it is entered in the heavenly sanctuary for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever, According to the order of who? Melchizedek. You know, Melchizedek had no beginning, no end. So he represents an everlasting priest. Now to prove that Christ is superior as our priest to the Levitical priest of the Old Testament, he has to first prove that Melchizedek is superior to the Levites. Here's the argument. Verse 7. Chapter 7 of Hebrews, verse 7. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. This is typical Jewish culture. Here, mortal men, referring to the Levites, receive tithe, because the Jews paid tithe to the Levites. But there, that is Melchizedek, he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. So when Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek, was his son Isaac born? Yes or no? No. Was Jacob born? And Levi was not even heard of. Okay? Keep that in mind. But now look at the next verse. Verse 9. Even Levi, who receives tithe, paid tithe through or in Abraham, so to speak. How could Levi pay tithe to Abraham, to Melchizedek in Abraham, long before he was born? Here is the answer. Verse 10. For he was still 
in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So Levi was in the loins of Abraham. Makes no sense to us, you know. But folks, that's biblical solidarity. That is why it is important to accept this fact. In the light of biblical solidarity, how could God qualify Christ and qualify him legally to represent, to be the second or last Adam or last humanity, so that he could legally present to be the substitute of mankind? Folks, if we do not solve this problem, we are not touching 70% of the world population. See, this is what I believe, that God raised John the Baptist to prepare the Jewish nation for the first coming of Christ. And I believe that God raised the Advent movement to prepare the Gentile world for the second coming of Christ. And for us to fulfill that mission, this global mission, we have to understand biblical solidarity and how Christ became part of it. Okay, let's go on. According to Acts 17, 26, what does your Bible say? Acts 17, 26. Listen to what Luke penned here. Acts 17 and verse 26. And he, that is God, has made from one blood or one person of all, this for one, there are different translations, but they all say the same thing. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. So what is Luke telling us here? See, the word blood in the Bible represents life. So what Luke is telling us that the human race is the extension or the multiplication of Adam's life. This corporate sinful life is described in the New Testament by the Greek word bios. And I'm going to teach you two words today from the original. From this word bios, we have the word biography or biology. Now turn to 1 John. I want to show you something. 1 John, not the gospel, but the epistle. Please turn to 1 John chapter 2 and we are going to read verse 16. 1 John Chapter 2 and verse 16. I'll start with verse 15 to get the context. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now look at verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are the three basic drives of the sinful human nature is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now that word life there, in, in verse 16, is bios in the original. Now I want to show you something else, another word. When the New Testament, or when the Bible talks, especially the New Testament, or the uh, Septuagint, which is the old Greek Old Testament, when they speak of God's life, they use a complete different word, zoe. These are the two words I want you to understand. And I'm giving you another text, this time the Gospel of John, chapter 8 and verse 12. This is Jesus talking. John 8 and verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And that word life is Zoe. Now you notice in your English Bible, both words are translated by the word life. So you can't tell the distinction. But fourth. The distinction is extremely important. So what I have done is I've given you a whole bunch of texts in the New Testament. All the texts in the left-hand side, if you read your, these texts in your English Bible where you have the word life, the Greek word is bios. And if you read the text in the right-hand side, which describes God's life, all those texts where the, your Bible says life is zoe. Now, I know you want to take it down. Well, you can ask them to make a copy of the disc, you know, much faster. <laughs> but folks, we need to know the distinction. Here's the reason. In the incarnation, God united this corporate bios life that belongs to the human race, of the human race, to the divine Zoe life of Christ in the womb of Mary. Remember what 
the angel said to Mary, Blessed is thou among women, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will conceive. It was at the incarnation, the Holy Spirit joined the corporate human life of, of Bios to the divine life of Zoe in Christ. That is why we read in John 1.14, and the word which is divine, which is God, became flesh, became us. And we beheld the glory of God, full of grace and truth. Turn now to 1 Corinthians. I want you to notice something that Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and look at verse 45. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The last Adam is referring to Christ. Now, we call him the second Adam. There is nothing wrong with that because there is no third Adam in the Bible. There are only two Adams. The first one ruined us. The second one redeemed us. So Christ is the last humanity. Okay, now. Biblical solidarity helps us to understand what Paul taught in Romans 5, 12 to 21. But I want to start with 12 to 14. So now let's look, let's turn our Bibles to Romans 5. And uh, I'm going to take you step by step so that you really understand what the good news of the gospel is. I'll tell you folks, when I understood this message way back in 1970, all doubt about my salvation was gone. I had absolute assurance of salvation even though I was still struggling with the flesh. And I hope you have the same. Chapter 5, verse 12 to 14. Let me read it first, then I'll explain it to you. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, and the Greek word is mankind, because all sin. Verse 13 and 14. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed or counted when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Now what is Paul saying here? Okay. Adam is a type or pattern of Christ, the last Adam. That's what he's saying at the end of verse 14. Let us look at these verses 12, 13, and 14 in detail. You need to understand what Paul, where Paul is coming from. In verse 12, Paul gives us three results of Adam's sin on the human race, to you and me. Number one, sin entered the world. That is, he entered mankind through Adam. Folks, you did not become a sinner because you sinned. You were born a sinner, thanks to Adam. And I'll prove it to you in a moment. Number two, this sin caused Adam's death. Because God said to Adam, the day you sin, you shall surely what? Die. But number three is the, the important one. This death, because he, this sin entered human race, this death passed on to all humanity. And then you have that phrase, because all what? In the past historic tense. That last phrase has caused a lot of controversy within the Christian church and our own. You know? Okay, let's see what the problem is. Regarding this last statement, because all sin, did Paul mean all die because all sinned like Adam? Or did he mean all die because all sinned in Adam? Very important issue. We have people in our church and other den denominations, other scholars, who agree with both of them. You have people on both sides. <laughs> okay, let's see. Our answer is extremely important since Paul is using Adam as a type or pattern of Christ, which we saw in the last part of verse 14. This will affect our understanding of the good news of the gospel. That's why it is important. If we say all die because all sin, like Adam... To be fair to Paul's analogy, in verse 12 to 21, we must also teach that all live because they all obeyed like Christ. How many of you have done it? 
you know, I sat down at Loma Linda with the two of the biggest independent ministries who believe that we die because we sin like Adam. Firm Foundation, which was in Washington State, it's now moved away. And Heartland from Virginia. You know, when my book came out, Beyond Belief, they stood up at the camp. Colin Stanley stood up and said, this is of the devil. And his own people said to him, have you discussed this with the author? And followed Matthew 18 and they said no. So they invited me to come to Loma Linda and discuss the book. They paid their fare for all the writers and speakers, 30 of them. They did not pay my fare. I was in Walla Walla then, so I had to pay my own fare. But I was willing to do that. And I said to them at the very beginning, we may not see eye to eye, but let God do the judging. Because if you're sincere, you must believe I'm sincere too. You know what one of their leaders said? God has raised us up, given us the mantle to correct the church. So I realized they were not teachable. But they took the position that we all die because we sin like Adam. They believe that every time we sin, we go back to condemnation until you confess that sin. So I gave them this example. I said, let, let us say I commit a sin, and before I confess it, I'm crossing the road, and a car hits me and kills me. Am I lost? I had not confessed that sin. You know what the answer was? Technically, yes, you were lost. But, they had a but, God is love. He'll give you one second to confess that sin before you die. Here I'm in agony. Do you think I'm in a position to confess that sin? So I said, where did you get this theology from? Not even Ellen G. White teaches that. I tell you, man, no wonder our people, you know, are groping in darkness, not hope of salvation. On the other hand, no, let me go back, you know. We must also teach, if we say that we all die because we sin like, we must also say we sin like Adam. But now on the other hand, if we say all die because all sin in Adam, it must also be true that all live because we obeyed in Christ. And that, folks, is Paul's theology. The question is not which answer is right, like Adam or in Adam. The question is, what is Paul teaching? Because he's the one who's inspired. Okay, let's look at it. Paul clearly states that all are condemned to that because of Adam's offense. In the same way, all are justified unto life because of Christ's obedience. Let's read verse 15 to 18. I know verse 17 and 18 was read in our scripture reading. But I want to read verse 15 to 18. Listen to what Paul says. But the free gift is not like that of the offense. For if by one man's offense, that is Adam's sin, death, many, the many died. The many, because the original has the many, the human race died. Much more, the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, are bounded to the many. And the gift is not like that which came to the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense, please notice the past tense, resulted in condemnation. But the free gift, which came from many offenses, resulted in justification. And then verse 17, for if by one man's offense, death reigned, came as a conqueror to the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, please notice the gift, will reign in life to the one Jesus Christ. Here's the conclusion. Therefore, as to one man's offense, judgment came, past tense, to all mankind, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came, past tense also, to how many people? To all men, resulting in justification of life. That's a hard statement if you have not understood biblical solidarity. Paul is not saying that Christ made it possible for us to be saved. He's clearly presenting the fact that all men were justified unto life because of the obedience of one man, Jesus Christ. Okay, 
To prove his point, I want you to note Paul's argument in Romans 5, 13 and 14. You know, I've struggled with this with my, my brethren and they have a hard time accepting what Paul is writing. Let's read verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed or counted or reckoned when there is no law. The answer I get from all these scholars I discuss this issue is that, but they knew the law. Folks, the issue is not whether they knew the law or not. The issue was the law was never given as a legal code until Mount Sinai in tables of stone. You know, when I first came to this country in 1882, I was pastored in the church in Idaho, Nampa Church. And I had a policeman in my church, a traffic policeman. And uh, three months after we arrived in this country, the federal government changed the speed limit from 55, what they call double nickels, to 65. And I said to this policeman, guy, I said, tomorrow I'll do 65 and you cannot touch me. And he said, yes, I can. I said, haven't you heard the good news? And he said, it doesn't matter how often the media announces the action taken by the federal government. You are judged by the sign on the road. And do you know, it took a whole year before Idaho State changed the speed limit from 55 to 65. Because that's the law. What is on the road? The sign on the road. And the law became legal when God gave it on tables of stone. Yes, they may have known the law, but it was not a legal code. You know, I was attending a board meeting for the school in, in, in Boise. And uh, I discovered that one of the pastors who was a in the, member of the board was from Sweden. In fact, I preached in his church in 1961 in Sweden. So I, I didn't realize he had come to this country. So he was coming with me. I was taking him home because his wife could not pick him up. And he was pouring with rain. And in those days, I, had, I did not have non-reflecting glasses. So every time a car came towards me, my eyes were blinded, so I would move to the right. And moving to the right, I crossed a line that was reserved only for bicycles. I did not know that. Nobody told me. And after a short time, I saw the traffic police car behind me with his red light. And I said, what would I do? I was not speeding. In fact, I was going below speed limit. And he came very close to me. I, thought, I think he thought I was, I, had, I was drunk. And he said, I want to see your license. And I realized, I said, officer, both of us are pastors in the Adventist church. We don't drink. <laughs> and then he said, but you have broken the law. I said, what law? When you crossed that white line, you were going in the bicycle lane. You were breaking the law. And I said to him, I had no idea this was the law. And he said to me, don't do it again. <laughs> and since then, I do my very best never to cross the white line. Because now I know it's the law. Okay, so Paul is saying that even though these people from Adam to Moses were sinning, God could not condemn them for breaking any law that he had given them as a legal code. But look at verse 14. Nevertheless, in spite of this fact, death reigned from Adam to Moses. These people were dying. Even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. Please notice the play of words. Sin is missing the mark. Transgression is a deliberate violation of a known commandment. When Eve brought that forbidden fruit to Adam, did he know it was the forbidden fruit? Yes or no? Yes. Could he save Eve by eating it? No. Did he know that by eating it he would die? Yes. Then why did he do such a, if I may use the word stupid word, act? I'll tell you why. Because he was created in the image of God. His nature was agape love that has no self in it. He loved Eve more than himself. And so he said to Eve, I'm going to die with you. Wasn't that wonderful? But the moment he ate the fruit, his nature changed. You need to read Steps to Christ, page 17. When Adam sinned, love disappeared and selfishness took its place. And so when God came to that, in that evening to see him, he said, God, yes, I did it. But don't blame me. You gave me a defective wife. 
And ever since then, we are blaming everybody else for our mistakes. Sometimes we even blame the devil. No, folks, our problem is the flesh. We have a nature that is dominated by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And unfortunately, when you accept Christ, no change takes place to your nature. Your nature is just as sinful as it was before your conversion. And that's the struggle we fight in this world. Our nature will not change, I'll show you in a moment, until the second coming of Christ when this corruption puts on incorruption. God could not legally condemn those living from Adam to Moses, verse 13, even though they were sinning. Yet they were dying even though their sins were unlike Adam's transgression, verse 14. The question remains, were they dying for their personal sins or were they dying because they sinned in Adam? This, folks, is the issue. Okay, I want to read verse 14. 15 to 8 once again. I want to see very clearly what Paul is teaching. Because he's the inspired person. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense, the many, I'm using the, the because it's in the original, the many, the human race, died. Much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to the many. Verse 16, and the gift is not like that which came to the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. There is condemnation for the whole human race. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. Verse 17, for by the one man's offense, death reigned, came as a conqueror to the one. Much more, those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, through, as, through one man's offense, judgment came to all mankind, because that's the word Paul used, resulting in condemnation. So folks, we were born in death row, thanks to Adam. Even so, in the same way, through one man's righteous act, the obedience of Christ, the free gift came, to all mankind, resulting in justification of life. Do you realize, folks, the whole human race was justified in Christ at the cross? That is why, in Matthew 25, when Jesus will divide the human race into sheep and goats, he will say to both groups, whatsoever you have done to the least of these human beings, this least of these brethren, including the stranger, which means the unbeliever, you have done it to me. Folks, Jesus has identified himself with the entire human race. That is why he is not ashamed to call us brethren in Hebrews 2 verse 11. Okay, now let's go on. Once Paul proved that it is Adam's sin that condemns the whole human race to that, he can now use Adam as a type or a pattern of Christ in the last part of verse 14. Okay, this can be illustrated by the bulletin. You know People have a hard time with this concept, so I'm going to use an illustration. And I'm going to use my son who's sitting here. <laughs> he and his wife were in China for a couple of years. That's where they got their first grandchild, Jasmine. I want to send this Bible to my son. But before I do that, I take this bulletin that represents all of us, and I put it in the Bible. What has happened? The two has become what? One. And that's the word together that Paul will use in Ephesians 2, 5 and 6. We were made alive together with Christ. We were raised together with Christ. And we are actually sitting in heavenly places together with Christ. Biblical solidarity. Okay, now, I mailed this Bible, wrap it up in brown paper, mail it to Hubei province, where my son is. And in those days, it was illegal to import Bibles into China. So the postmaster opens the, the parcel. He has to examine everything that comes to China. He sees it's the Holy Bible. He takes it out and he burns it. What happens to the bulletin? What happens to it? Why? I didn't send the bulletin. I sent the Bible. Why should the bulletin get burnt? Because it is where? In the Bible. Folks, that is exactly how God saved us. If you read Ephesians 1 verse 4, 
God put us in Christ before the foundation of the world, before we, even were, we were created, so that Christ may be, we may be holy and blameless in Jesus Christ. But let's go on. I want you to get this clear. Okay? Turning to verse 15, Paul explains how Adam and Christ are similar and how they differ. What they both did affected the entire human race. Paul makes it clear. Adam's sin affected the entire human race. Christ's obedience affected the whole human race. It is only in this sense these two men are similar. But they are different. Adam's sin affected humanity by condemning us to death. That's why even babies die, even though they commit no sin. Christ's obedience, the opposite, justified the entire human race unto life. Folks, that's good news. Now, you notice, note W.W. W. Prescott. You know, when, for many years, I could not understand. When I did my dissertation on the 18th message, I could not understand why the brethren were opposing to this message. And I realized why. These guys had Western minds. They could not understand biblical solidarity. They could not understand what Wagner and Jones were preaching, so they rejected the message. The only pioneer who understood this truth was Prescott, Professor Prescott. And he tried his best to convince the church. Seven years later, after 1880, in 1895, at the General Conference, he presented three studies. And those three studies is the divine human family. And I thank God, Dr. Richard Marker, who was president of New York Conference, had it published in a little booklet, the three studies. Now, I won't read you the whole booklet because you will be yelling at me. It's time for lunch. So I'll read you only one passage, which is, you can see, is based very strongly on the biblical solidarity. What is known as universal legal justification. That's what took place at the cross. Okay, I'll read you. And the flesh which he, which Christ took, and in which he dwelt was our flesh. And we were there in him, and he in us. And now look at his argument. Just as Levi was there in Abraham, and just as what Abraham did, Levi did in Abraham, so what Jesus Christ in the flesh did, we did in him. And this is the most glorious truth in Christianity. It is Christianity itself. It is the very core and life and heart of Christianity. He took our flesh and our humanity and what was found in him and what he did, humanity did in him. Folks, the world needs to hear this. You see, until we convince the world that on the cross, because Jesus was not just one man among many men, he was all of humanity gathered in him. Once the world dis discovers this, folks, there will be no excuse for them to be lost. Because this gospel is telling them that they were already justified unto life at the cross. There is no way, no need to run away from the cross. Okay, now, I want you to note verse 16 of Romans 5. Please notice, because I want you to realize, folks, I know this is heavy stuff. You probably will have spiritual indigestion after this study. But do what Paul asked Timothy to do in chapter 2 of Timothy, verse 7. Consider what I have told you, and the Lord will give you understanding. But look at verse 16. In verse 15 of Romans 5, Paul tells us that Adam's one offense brought about death for the whole human race. The second half, much more, the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to the many. Now look at verse 16. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense, have you got it? One offense resulted in condemnation. Condemnation for the whole human race. But look at the second half. But the free gift which came from how many offenses in your Bible? Many. See, if Christ had died for Adam's sin, he would not solve our problem. Because besides Adam's sin, we have committed many, many sins since the law was posted as, as a legal requirement. Jesus did not die just for Adam's sin. He died for Adam's sin plus all your sins, all my sins, past, present and future. 
every sin was forgiven at the cross. Do you know no one will die because of their sins at the end? The only sin that Christ did not die for and which people will die for is the sin of unbelief. Deliberately, persistently rejecting the gift of salvation. Okay, let's go on because I can hear your tummies rumbling. Another important fact is what Adam passed on to humanity. He is inherited. We have no choice there, folks. Because the life we were born with is the life that Adam passed on to us. It's a life that already sinned when Adam sinned. But Christ's righteousness is God's gift to mankind and has to be received. Look at verse 17. For if by the one man offense death reigned, it came as a conqueror for the whole human race to the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, have you got it? It's a gift, will reign in life to the one Jesus Christ. I want you to notice the word receive. The gift is for all. You know, when I present this, I'm accused of teaching universalism, which says, believes and teaches that all will go to heaven. I have never taught that. The gift is for all men. All men were justified unto life at the cross. But like any gift, you have to receive it to enjoy it. And those who deliberately, persistently reject this gift after the Holy Spirit has convinced them of this incredible good news, they will have no excuse but to die with Satan in the lake of fire. Okay, the life we were all born with, okay, uh, all born with bios is the multiplication of Adam's condemned life. We've saw that already. But the life we receive in Christ by faith, for those who accept Christ, is his eternal life, Zoe life. Let me put it this way. On the cross, the bios life which Christ assumed at the incarnation died in Christ not for three days, but forever. That's the only way the law would be satisfied. So you and I died in Christ before we were born. I know that sounds kind of complicated. People kept telling me, how could I die, how could I be in Christ before I was born? It's very simple, folks. The life that you were born with existed 2,000 years ago. That's the life that was united to Christ. So you were not born 2,000 years ago, but the life that you were born with was united to Christ. And he died on the cross forever, satisfying the justice of the law. But God so loved the world that he took the Zoe life of Christ and gave it to the human race. That's the good news of the gospel. You don't believe me? Let's turn to 1 John. There are many texts, but I'm going to give you just one that is very clear. 1 John, not the gospel, the epistle. 1 John chapter 5, and we look at verse 11 and 12. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. And this is the testimony, this is the record, this is the facts. That God has given us what? Guess what the life is in the original? Zoe. And this Zoe is in his son. He who has the son has Zoe. And this is the basis of what we know, the doctrine of adoption. We have been adopted because we have received the life of Christ. He who does not have the Son, verse 12, of God, does not have Zoe. He still has bios, that is, has to, you know, it has to die. But folks, you and I receive by faith the eternal life of Christ. That is why in Hebrews 2, verse 11, Christ is not ashamed to call you and me his brethren. Because we share the same life. This is the basis of the doctrine of adoption. Okay. Turning to verse 19 of Romans. Go back to Romans 5. Turning to verse 19. Paul points out yet another problem we inherited in Adam. His sin not only condemns mankind to death, but also made us sinners. I have a hard time trying to convince my brethren. But let's see what Paul says. He's the inspired person. Chapter 19 of chapter 5 of Romans. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made what? What does your Bible say? Were made what? Sinners. And in the Greek, there is a different word from sinners and sinful. Paul did not use the word sinful. He, Adam's sin made us sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. If you look at Ephesians 2 verse 3, the last part, Paul read, wrote there that we are by nature, under the wrath of God. By nature. But now there is something you need to notice. 
The incredible good news of the gospel is that Christ's obedience not only justified us to life, but one day we believers will be made righteous by nature. Now I want you to notice the verb tense in verse 19, because verbs are important, they deal with action. Verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, past, present, or future. Thank you. Now look at the second. So also, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. What tense? Future. Because it's dealing with nature. Folks, even though God may give you victory over sins, and I believe he can do that, you will still be a sinner by nature until the second coming of Christ. You know, we grow a lot of apples here. Maybe Washington has better apples than we do here. But in winter, the apple trees have no leaves and no fruit. Is it still an apple tree? Is it still 100% an apple tree? Yes. So apples don't make it an apple tree. It only proves what kind of tree it is. So also our sins don't make us sinners. Our sins prove what we are by nature. So, and we will be by nature until the sec sinners by nature until the second coming of Christ. So stop looking at yourself for acceptance before God. Look at Jesus Christ. He's your righteousness. Okay. In verse 20, Paul gives one reason why God gave the law. Not the only reason, but one reason. Not to solve the sin problem, but to expose it. Now, I want you to turn to Romans 7, because here Paul explains something that many of us are guilty of. The Jews looked at sin only as an act. Remember the Pharisee would stand up and say, I've never murdered anyone. And Jesus said, one moment, if you hate somebody without a cause, you've already murdered him in your heart. Or if you look at a woman to last, even though you don't commit the act, you've already committed adultery. Because the law of God doesn't only demand perfect obedience. It demands perfect desires, perfect motives. And when you realize that, you will say, who can be saved by the law? But let's read it. Romans 7, verse 7. In verse 6, chapter 6 of Romans, Paul explains how we were delivered from under the law. But in chapter 7, how we were delivered from under sin. So in verse 7 of chapter 7 of Romans, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? His answer is certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Is this ceremonial or moral law? What do you think? Moral law. And coveting is not an act. It's a cherished desire in your heart or in your mind. Look at verse 8. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil what? Desire. So even as a Pharisee, even though he claimed he was blameless as a Pharisee, now he, as a Christian, he realizes that when he was a Pharisee, he was full of evil desires. He never did the acts. So he thought he was sinless. Apart from the law, sin is dead. is non-existing. And then he adds in verse 9, I was alive once without the law. That is, I had not understood the law as a Pharisee, as a Jew. But when the commandment came, sin revived and who died? I died. And the commandment, verse 10, which was to bring life. That is the Jewish teaching. We are saved by keeping the law. I found to bring death. Folks, there are too many Adventists who are in this camp. They need to realize this situation. Okay, verse 21 is Paul appealing to believers, those who accepted Christ by faith. Before our conversion, death reigned over us. We were in death row. Now, since we accepted Christ, we must allow grace to reign until eternity is ushered in. And my concluding text is Revelation 20. This is the blessed hope that I'm looking forward to, and I hope you are too. Revelation 20, verse 6. Revelation 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy. Have you got it? The word blessed means happy. Happy and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. That is the believers. Over such, the second death has no power. 
because we already died the second death in Christ. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. Isn't that wonderful hope? The blessed hope. Okay, folks. The most valuable thing we possess in this world is not our houses or our cars or assets or bank account, but the faith of who? Please notice, I put the faith of in italics. You know why? Because the New Testament makes a distinction between the faith of Jesus and the faith in Jesus. The faith of Jesus is what Christ had and which gave him the, gave him the, gave it, made it possible for the Holy Spirit to totally control him so that he lived a perfect life. The faith in Jesus is our faith in what his faith did 2,000 years ago. And there has to make, be made a distinction. We are not saved. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach we are saved because of our faith. We are saved by faith or through faith. Faith is only an instrument or a channel by which we receive the righteousness of Christ which was already obtained for us 2,000 years ago. In view of this, listen to the counsel. That was not my last act. This is my last act, sorry. You know, I've seen your moments. Hebrews chapter 10. Please look at verse 35 and 39, to 39, the last two verses. Hebrews 10, the last few verses, 35 to, to 39. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence. This is the writer writing to the Jews. Don't cast away your confidence in Jesus Christ, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. The blessed hope. And the will of God in 1 John 3.23 is accepting Jesus as your Savior. Now look at verse 37. For yet a little while. Now folks, this was written 2,000 years ago. Yet a little while. So to God, little while can be, you know, 2,000 years. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Verse 38. But the just shall live how? By faith in Jesus Christ. But if anyone draws back, if you turn your back on Christ, my soul has no pleasure in him. So nowhere does the Bible teach once saved, always saved. That's a Calvinist concept. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Folks, the most valuable thing you possess in this world is your faith in Christ. Okay, may this be our experience and our message. You know, Revel Matthew 24 has all kinds of pro pro uh, prophecies about the second coming of Christ. The most important one to me is Matthew 24 verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached into all the world for a witness, for a testimony. And the end will come. When the world hears and is convicted by the Holy Spirit that they were already justified unto life at the cross, it will become inexcusable for them to be lost they would have to deliberately, persistently, and ultimately reject the gift of salvation in Christ. Then the end can come. And I, my prayer is that you will experience this incredible good news, that all doubt about your salvation. You know, I've, I've sat by the bedside of two GC workers who were afraid to die because they were not sure they would make it. And they were, one of them was a youth director for the general conference. And I said, how can you be a youth director for the general conference and not be sure of your salvation? The other one was the president of the general conference. Folks, we must restore this message to our people. That in Jesus Christ, they already have salvation, full and complete. You can't add to it, you can't improve on it. And once you've understood it, then present it to the world, to your neighbors, to your friends, and to your fellow members. That is my prayer in Jesus' name. Okay, let us pray. Loving Father, what we dealt with today is a difficult subject. It is a complete contradiction of our Western way of thinking. But we thank you, Lord, that you have made it clear through the Apostle Paul and through the 1880 message, which Jesus, Sister White described as the most precious message that is to lighten this world. Please restore that message. We thank you for the light bearers who are restoring it. We thank you for Elizabeth Talbot who is restoring it. We thank you for Carl Kozat at Walla Walla, professor of theology, is restoring it. But for folks, we all need to restore it. Lord, please restore this message so that the world may be lightened with your glory. 
so that the end can come and we can go home. Until then, keep our eyes focused on Jesus, who was the, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Bless us to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.